Howdy. Welcome back to For Your Reference. We are starting off with a Patreon shout out. What, what? We just launched our Patreon. So we want to say thank you so much to even if you've just visited the page because naming those tiers was a good old time, even with the unauthorized sentiment. Mm-hmm. So we definitely want to give a shout out to, well, within 24 hours, we got um, a nice, cute, delicious, very handsome um, bunch of Patreons, OT. We sure did. So definitely want to give a shout out. Uh, Colby Mack, if you follow us in linear time, we did do an episode a couple of episodes ago um, with Colby. Yo, yo, yo. <laughs> yo 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 he was a first patreon as well so thank yep. you so much colby told me podcast we will put the link in the show notes make sure you check him out and also check out our power episode if you've watched power and you want to have a discussion about it our second patreon was lucas from wonder soul mm. the bob ross of the podcasting world oh i love wonder soul we love wonder soul so much and he's so supportive and you know look out next year we're going to have a collab, which would be quite nice. Um, we beard all... goals as well, mate. I'm trying to reach there, so hopefully. Me too, and I think I'm going to beat you too, though. <laughs> <laughs> we also have our lovable one-third of the holy trinity of the podcasting world, Ben from Film Busters. Oh, Ben. There's a theme here, OT. Is there? Yes. Ben introduced um, at least Katie to Lebowski. Yourself, actually. Yeah. Yes. So make sure you check out that episode um, of The Big Lebowski with the big Ben Zowski. (laughs) (laughs) Um, One Soul also has a podcast and he does a lot of creative stuff. Ben also has a podcast with Film Busters and he writes really primo, poignant movie reviews as well. And to round it all off... Round the world to Australia, we also have Dem Fancy Dinosaurs as well. Oh, dinosaurs. Who knew they still existed in Australia? So Nick and Kyle and the crew, thank you so much. Uh, so yes, um, all of these lovely people have podcasts and they're amazing and it's primo stuff. So we'll put the link in the show notes. Now we will delight you in Quid promo with wonder soul and also dem fancy dinosaurs wonder soul wonder soul wonder soul hey i'm lucas the host of wonder soul weekly podcast series featuring a variety of topics dealing with life's many passions and experiences join me and friends each week as i discuss topics ranging from pop culture to real life conversations that all can find relatable New episodes bring new guests and new topics and release every Friday. More content can be found on Wonder Soul's YouTube and Twitch channels. Stay up to date and connect with Wonder Soul through social media by following us on Twitter and Instagram. And we hope that you enjoy Wonder Soul wherever you listen to podcasts. So do good and take care. Hey guys, it's Kyle and Nick. And we're from Dem Fancy Dinosaurs, a weekly comedy podcast revolving around movies, TV shows, and pop culture. We release a new episode every Thursday. And you can find us on Apple Podcasts? Why did you say that like a question? I don't know. Okay, anyway, yes, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and any of the podcatchers. Or you can look up www.demfancydinosaurs.com. Thanks, guys. Stay fancy and enjoy the rest of the show. Friends and lovers, welcome back to For Your Reference. You've got your host, KT. And OT. And hot diggity dog. What an episode we have for you today. Oh, oh, oh. Can't wait for this. Right? Um, and I'm not KT Lang, unfortunately. And apparently, I can't go out dancing without yelling along to all of the songs that are playing at the discotheque. <laughs> so if you're out for a dance, um, come and call me. But it's not great for podcasting. Um, and we also got a few tears in this as well. So that's that's why I'm a bit more husk than mm. sexy husk today. 
unfortunately. Today we are covering, it is it is undisputedly, if you'll pardon the pun, a classic. Is it not so? It is a classic. 2004, Million Dollar Baby. Mm. Directed by Clint Eastwood, no less. And he also won an award, an Oscar for that. Um, the screenplay by Paul Haggis. <laughs> Haggis. Um, and this is adapted from short stories from FX Tool, who was a boxer trainer as well. Yeah. Um, like I mentioned, it did have quite a few awards. So before we get into the stats, I just want to mention that four Oscars in 2005. Best motion picture. Mm-hmm. Hilary Swank, thank goodness, got an Oscar for her leading role. Morgan Freeman also got an Oscar for his role. He deserves an Oscar just for breathing. Mm. Right? Yeah. His narration really tied together this film, but we will come to that. And then also, like I mentioned, Clint Eastwood won for directing. Mm. Let's get into the stats. 2004, quite a modest budget for 2004 as well. $30 million. Oh. Yeah. Do you want to guess the worldwide gross? Oh, I'd say, I'd say um, 90 mil. Where are we where what planet are you on? <laughs> what what Rick and Morty multiverse are you in, sir? No. Two hundred and sixteen point seven million dollars. Thank Bloody you. Bloody hell, much. I was way off. <laughs> and again, thank goodness you're not at the helm. I just thought the time, you know, two thousand and four, how many people were going to the cinemas back then? Oh, I hope there's not a multiverse out there where I do the editing. Mm. Because it's just not going to happen, is it? (laughs) Not at all. But you know what did happen? This film. Let's dive into the cast, though, T, before we get into our first impressions. Mm -hmm. Just a little sprinkling, just a bit of a peppering of what this episode will entail. Clint Eastwood, Mm. Hilary Swank, Mm -hmm. Morgan Freeman. Mm -hmm. These are people we know. And then we started to realize there were quite a lot of heavy hitters um, in this film. Yeah. Um, Jay Brichel, I fucking love him. He's, He's solid. Just, oh, I just want him in my pocket. I just want him in my shoelace. I want him everywhere. Um, Mike Coulter, who's your Luke Cage, mm-hmm. which you got correct. And um, OT deserves accolades. If you're having a beverage, take a sip for OT because he doesn't really place people <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, we also had Anthony Mackie as well uh, and Michael Pena. Off the top of our heads. But mm. we, we will get into the cast and what all of that means. But let's start off with first impressions. So this is the second time I've watched the movie. The first time back then when it came out, I watched it with my brother. And I think I sort of just didn't understand the gravitas uh-huh. of the story and exactly what they were trying to put out there. And yep. I just blame that solely on me being young and dumb. Well, you're still one of those things. <laughs> oh, young. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that proves the other thing. Oh, <laughs> uh, Just watching it the second time yesterday with you and it moved me to tears. It did both of us actually. Mm. And wow, it's been a while since I felt completely satisfied after watching a movie. Like I felt the narrative just came through. The allegories used in this, like oh, bloody hell. It it was just amazing writing. And the fact that you read at the end of this that Clint Eastwood pretty much did everything, including composing the bloody song in this. Like, what else? What else do you need from a movie? Ah, I thought you were going to spoil something. That's why I was shouting Nah, no spoilers for me here today. Well, at least for the first five minutes, mate. There will be spoilers (laughs) later on. Don't worry, we'll break you in nice and well. Make sure you're well lubricated. Mm, but yeah, I was completely impressed by it. It's surprising. So did you watch it around the time that it came out? Yeah. It's surprising that something that was so fulfilling, as you said, it didn't last with you. Because I would, I will never forget this viewing experience. Oh, the, It was just a weird time in my life. I guess I just didn't give it much attention. Um, was it in between the hundredth time of watching Baby Boy? or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's ot's experience just rolled up into one i felt like i've missed something really great in my life not having watched this uh or not having realized how good this movie was up until yesterday when i when we rewatched it and i i was like oh this is such a great film and then it got really sad in the last two thirds and i'm like why didn't you warn me that this was a sad film 
Yeah, it is sad. But the, the beauty of it is that by the end of the movie, you start wrapping a lot of things in your mind and piecing a lot of pieces. And you're thinking deeper about the movie itself and being like, whoa. You know, you can watch it and think of it one way. Like, mm-hmm. let's say, um, Morgan Freeman's um, na- narration in this. Yeah. And then by the end of it, you're like, bloody hell. Um, it just transforms how the movie is perceived at it. It's a tasty morsel that you, you didn't know that you wanted, but you get. And you're surprised that you got it. Because a lot of the times we watch movies and we never really get the same sort of... Um, crescendo. Crescendo. And the fact that we'd watch this off the back of watching Knives Out, which was not one of the best things done, in my opinion. And I think the, all the hype is just more so to do with of the amount of stars it has. That's some sharp commentary. No, I'm just saying, if Knives Out had a, a, a low budget or whatever, a cast that wasn't all A-list, trust me, it wouldn't have gotten half the attention it got. But just watching this made me know exactly why we're doing this podcast and why we love watching movies. And just off the back of that, in regards to Knives Out, I was going to mention that too because we have, you know, as, as much as we try, we are a, yes, we are learned, but we do try and be an organised sort of operation in the four-year reference household. So we do try and schedule what our episodes are going to be, particularly if people want to, you know, watch ahead of time what episodes we're going to be covering. So we had, um, you know, a really shitty week and we were like, okay, as much as we love Adwale and as much as we love Dams and Idris, we're not going to do farming this week because we've had a really shitty week. We want something fun and thrilling with intrigue. Mm. So we went to go and watch Knives Out and we were severely cut off from any sort of enjoyment. And I'm not even going to say pardon the pun because it's not worth it. And, right? and, and you know, one of the problems is like when you figure out a movie by halfway through. Dude, and we didn't figure it out. They literally presented it to us. No. Spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. We're not going to say what the spoiler is. But it's how is it a who done it when they present something to you? Well, that they presented much... one half of it, and it was pretty easy to detect the other half of it, like to deduce exactly no, what's going to happen it's, afterwards. It, it's the constant turns and it's the constant twist in regards to a who done it that makes it so thrilling. You 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 pretty much suspect everyone right until the end, and I think that's as much as you're going to get in regards to a knives out review. When we have our celebratory one year episode we will have it in memoriam because it killed all of our feelings and all of our hearts and knives out is going to be on there because that was a fucking mess and ryan is disgusting and it you know what i haven't seen a bad review for knives out yet but i feel like everyone's getting paid and we're not getting paid (laughs) throw us the money mate we'll change your tunes (laughs) (laughs) nah not even for this um so so let, let's go back. But essentially, that, that is the place that we're coming from. And we're like, okay, so obviously we need to do an episode, but we just wanted to watch something that was good. Mm. And I'm not sure if, where people feel, because this was like over 10 years ago. Yeah, Crazy how time moves. Yeah. My knees are hurting, but time moves along, apparently. And we just wanted to watch something good. And this is where we landed upon, my friends and lovers. And what a fulfilling experience. Before we even get into the characters, let's just talk about, you know, you know, the cinematography. Let's talk about the soundtrack and let's talk about the narrative as a whole. Um, I'd like to hear your first impressions of this, though. I always knew it was around. I always knew the film was there. I knew that awards were won. I actually never really knew much about Hilary Swank either. Mm. And then she kind of disappeared. The last film I saw her in was when she was being like the Michelle Pfeiffer and like teaching inner city kids. Yeah. With the R&B singer Mario. That was really the last time I remember seeing her in something. I think I saw her in a Jared Butler sort of movie, I think. <laughs> oh, oh, it was, oh. It was a rom-com. Um, but yeah. With Hilary Swank? Yeah. Oh, how the tides have changed. Or maybe it wasn't Jared Butler, but it was a rom-com with someone. We're a film podcast, guys. <laughs> <laughs> if if you were wondering whether you should subscribe or not, mm. this is the time. Um, yeah, so I never really seen anything that Hilary Swank's in. Um, Clint Eastwood, wow. Mm. We watched The Good, The Bad and The Ugly maybe a couple of months ago. Mm. First of all, what a face. <laughs> but second of all, what a voice. My, my throat's been hurting and I was struggling watching him talk. 
(laughs) (laughs) And then, yeah, and then Morgan Freeman, like, you know you're in for a good time. It had all of the ingredients. And, you know, sometimes if you have too many big names, it can get in the way, Mm. which we've just given a very good example Mm. of. But it was great. I really... I really like the way that the scale of this film, the story that was being told was actually quite simple. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot of theatrics that was going on in regards to the storytelling. It was a very simple story of an underdog, Mm -hmm. but with pure grit and guts and really just pushing ahead. And that's what really drove this film to brilliance. Mm. Um, in regards to the directing, I <laughs> light and shade. Like I feel like Jordan Peele went to the Clint Eastwood school of directing. <laughs> like there was so much dark shadows in this, and I don't know if that was a style back then or if that if that's Clint Eastwood's thing. But it was. It felt like deliberately dark and shade and light in weird places. But when when Hilary Swank's character was training late at night and you had Morgan Freeman standing there but his face was in the dark, Mm. you could hear him talking so you knew it was him. So I don't understand what that sort of illusion was And then he stepped forward and then his face was illuminated and the rest of his body was blacked out. I just appreciated it. It's sort of a, a... an artistic take to just filming. Yeah, and but again, that's that's just a baby qualm. It's it's not a major foundational qualm. It. Cool. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I thought we weren't gonna fight. Well, that was just 300 episode. Yeah. <laughs> Knives up, mate. Gloves up. Ready. V- vomit. <laughs> vomit out. That's what it is. Um, let's go to the soundtrack. So Clint Eastwood contributed to that as well. Mm. I really liked it. You know, I feel like. I personally like two different types of soundtracks. There's a soundtrack that, you know, really embodies the intention and the key message mm. of the film. And it's it's very much at the forefront of your viewing experience. Yeah. This was a different sort of soundtrack. It really melded into the background. And there were a lot of times that I didn't even realize that there was any sort of score. Mm. Because it's so beautifully weaved itself into the dialogue. Yeah. Into the the fully satisfying character development. Mm. On a lot of characters, actually. I loved it. Um, it brought a lot of emotion, showed a lot of heart. Especially when it came to interactions between um Frankie and Maggie. Mm-hmm. Um, it just created that sort of ambiance that you really loved and it showed it it played into the emotions of how exactly Frankie felt for Maggie mm-hmm. without necessarily having to say anything a hundred percent and let's focus on Maggie mm. so she we see her waitressing mm-hmm. for a lot of the film, yeah, and she's you know what she is one of the most admirable sort of characters, and she was so perfectly placed as the protagonist of this film, yeah, you know. We start to see the the lack of nurture in the nature nurture sort of discussion, mm. and she had everything going wrong for her. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. When people have everything going wrong against them, first of all, it's understandable if they want to sit and watch the world burn, but she didn't. No, she pulled herself up and she tried to make something of herself. Mm. Right. And then you have really resonating, um, maybe not fully resonating, but on some level you can relate to her, you know, struggling, you know, with her coin jar and even, you know, taking the steak when she was a waitress Mm. so she could take it back home and have something to eat. Mm -hmm. Maybe not on that like literal sort of example, but we've all been through times where financially we're struggling. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you need to decide how how far you're going to extend yourself more than you thought you ever would Mm -hmm. and i really i really love that that's what we focused on and we actually got to know her before we knew of her struggle yeah because that plays even more to the credit to her character Mm. because they really could have you know because they I think it was um, Morgan Freeman's character when he was doing his narration. You know, there was one thing that Maggie knew. She was trash. Yeah. Right? And it's, you know, a lot of the time 
no offense. But when I think of like trailer trash, I think of like Eight Mile, mm. of like Eminem, and so it the story very much could have been from that point of view, showing this is where she came from and she's pulling herself out of there, mm. right? But we started the film from just her wanting to get in, get her hands dirty, and really try and make something of herself. Yeah. And then as the film unfolded, we started to see how the fuck did you even get where you are today from where you started, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, the, the way it was introduced when um, she was talking to Eddie's character, Morgan Freeman's character, um, she was saying, my brother's in jail. Yeah. My sister cashes checks for a kid that's not alive anymore, which is quite sad. Mm-hmm. We didn't really get much about that, but it just it's more of a peppering on the sister. Yeah. Um, the dad is no longer with them. And the mum is, well, <laughs> if you've watched the film, the mum is the mum. Right. And there's there's quite a lot of complexity that comes into that as well. But essentially, you know, she shares that part of her. Mm. Right. After we had started to get to know her. And I, you know what? It really is a craft. Mm. Being able to write a narrative, whether it's a short stories or whether it's a film, you really have to choose your moments. It's a very conscious sort of organism Mm. to choose when to reveal parts of the story Mm. because it really tailors the viewing experience that we have yeah so when she is talking to eddie and she's pretty much sharing you know everything that she's gone through and how she has to make it i already got emotional over there and that was quite early in the film Mm. if you do it right and if it's acted well there, there is there is nothing that I can't relate to. Yeah. And that's a challenge. Feel free to find the character that is acted well, written well, presented well. I will always find a way to resonate mm-hmm. with wholly realized characters. Yeah. And, and I love the, especially when it, perseverance is like one of the major themes in this. Mm-hmm. Um, perseverance in terms of not giving up in exactly what you're dreaming of. Uh, perseverance in terms of dealing with um, tough choices and hard choices that you have to make. Yeah, it's such a beautifully written story where you you get to see Maggie, who yep. is struggling. In it. she's thirty one. Mm-hmm. She's been waiting tables, but she knows that when she's boxing, that's where she is happy. That's where she is herself. Yeah. And the fact that she didn't let anyone tell her that it's impossible mm-hmm. just made it more appealing, at least to me, in terms of not only rooting for her to see how she would succeed and seeing how the journey takes her. Because at the end of the day, we knew that Maggie and Frankie would eventually team up because Frankie is dealing with his demons as well. Oh, yes. He has, um, he has a daughter, Katie. And hey, is it Katie Eastwood? <laughs> is, it, is he my Eastwood daddy? <laughs> Reply to your father, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but let's let's talk about Clint Eastwood. Mm. He has had an illustrious career, right? Um, I haven't partaken in all of his career, um, but I in what I've seen with him, he seems to gravitate towards characters of like the hardened old man. You know, that that is changed by the protagonist mm. usually, right? And the the emotional balance that needed to be spent between Clint Eastwood and also Hilary Swank is something that actors of lesser Cree would not be able to achieve. Yeah. The emotion and the, you know, the, the, the somberness mm. and the uneasiness that they had between these two characters the dynamics between the two, it was a delight. It was a delight to witness. And to be able to balance that in, you know, in a story that takes you all the way through to character development, I understand now why Clint Eastwood is shouting at chairs. Mm. Because it's a way to debrief from the emotional balance that he has to spend in this film. (laughs) <laughs> it's just affected him years and years later shouting at all these chairs yeah 
For sure. And if you understand that reference, you are most welcome, friends and lovers. It's for your reference. Like, if, if you told me to name a boxing movie that I loved, I feel like I'd leave this one out because I feel like it transcends a mere boxing flick. It's so much more, just more than a symbolism of boxing because I feel like they used it as a symbol to illustrate exactly the struggles in life that one has to perceive or to endure. Like, we have this moment between Frankie and Maggie and Frankie, um, Maggie tells Frankie about um, his father and the dog. Mm-hmm. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, and, and at the moment, you don't really realize the gravitas of that conversation. Well, it's foreshadowing. Yeah, it's for it's it's but foreboding. It's, 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 it's foreboding more than anything. And it's <laughs> forthcoming as well. <laughs> because you don't really well, I didn't really think of it that much. But that's that's good because it wasn't blatantly obvious. Yeah, it wasn't blatantly obvious. It was it was imparting a piece of yourself mm. of your past. Mm. Um I think we did say spoilers. Um, I, and you know, some sometimes people are like, "Oh, it's from t- over ten years ago. We don't need to say spoilers." Well, fuck you and the click you claim because you know there are younger people out there, or there's people like me that have holes in my foundational viewing experience. So I don't want to ruin it for people that haven't seen it. And unlike OT, I'm not going to shame you. <laughs> OT is all about that Game of Thrones shame. Yep. <laughs> but everything about this film and exactly what you're saying and i will pay my tithes to the pastor ot because that sermon was perfect thank you what i love about stories is where they are wholly personal narratives mm. yes it was about boxing but the boxing like you said is to further illustrate the growth the highs and lows, the yeah. tonality mm. of the story. Yeah. And that's also why I love John Wick because, yes, he's an assassin and you've got the high table, you know, you've got that whole spy sort of world, but it only serves to further the narrative of John Wick. Mm. And that's exactly what this film does with boxing. And I'm like, why did you make me watch Creed? Why didn't we watch this instead? Because you like your Michael J.B. Jordan, mate. Well, the fact that you got his name wrong again. JB Michael Jordan. Wait, let's listen, just move listen on. to our Black Panther <laughs> episode, guys. Uh, and take actually, don't take a shot every time OT gets it wrong because you'll be on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> but this, oh wow! And like, I don't think anyone is saying this is a bad film either. But I do feel like it deserves all the accolades it can get. Oh, for sure. So if we can do that together with our handful of listeners. That is what we're going to do today. Mm. And you know what I like about this? Like it's it's from a point of view of um, Scrap, Michael um, Morgan Freeman's character. Uh-huh. And it's not that he's inside the character's heads or anything. It's more of him as a voyeur because he's pretty much yeah. everywhere. <laughs> yeah, actually. Well, he's he, just hiding in the shadows and observing everything. He is God. He is omniscient. So... <laughs> Pretty much. Like when um Frankie was um killing Maggie at the end of the movie and Scrap was just there in the shadows watching. Yeah. You know, he's everywhere and you could see this in the entire movie. So it makes you feel as if, oh, okay, so it's not that he's just assuming things. He's actually just observing and most likely he's had conversation with Frankie and Maggie about most of the things that he's telling us. It creates an added layer of com- complexity and wonder into exactly how he's writing this letter to uh, Frankie's daughter. So let's. So I'll bait it being one of the longest letters that Gal will ever read. <laughs> right? Yeah, for but sure. It'll, it'll still be more enjoyable than, you know, actually, no. I was, I was going to fire some shots, but we're all about the love today. Um, there were some poignant points that you just literally skimmed over that I want to come back to. So you were talking about the foreshadowing mm. in regards to her childhood dog, um, mm. you know, passing away. Yeah. You, you said killed Hilary Swank. I'm saying passing away the dog. That says more about us too, but that's another thing. Um, but the, the vehicle of that symbolism of the dog having to be put down it's it's one of those things because when we when we move further into the story we haven't even talked about the triumphs yet of this film Mm. we like getting heavy (laughs) we do yeah we we like getting heavy in this podcast and we will bring some levity back but let's let's stay in this moment 
right? So, you know, she she gives that example with Frankie's character mm. talking about the dog. And then we move, there, there, there are many highs, but we're just going to focus on this low when she's in that hospital room. Yeah. And she said, do you remember what I told you about the dog? Yeah. I want you to do that for me. Mm. Oh. Tears. <laughs> tears. Every, every, every sort of crying session I repressed in my childhood just came back in that moment. Yeah. Sad. Yeah. But beautifully done. Very beautifully done. And what we saw, you know, as viewers, it, it was, it was very clear, you know, if Maggie couldn't have the life that she could have, and she lived a full life, right? Mm. But her life could never be the same after that accident. Yeah. It's not even an accident. Blue mm. Bear was f- coming in full force, right? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, after that happened, she knew that she wasn't going to get her life again. And slowly and slowly, her, her independence and her freedoms and all of her triumphs were being overshadowed by her current situation. Mm. And I think it, well, once they started to say that she had to amputate her leg, that's where she was like, no, nah, I, I can't do this anymore. I feel like she was there but she didn't say anything just because Frankie was so eager to keep her alive and to keep her. And, and that's, that's exactly, that's exactly what I'm leading up to. Cause we're watching this film and we're seeing that Maggie's struggling. Mm. Right. And, you know, she even attempted herself when she knew that he wasn't going to do it. You know, Maggie was trying to do it herself. Right. So as viewers, we're like, oh, come on now. You, you need to enter suffering. You need to do this. You need to do this. But at the same time, if that was me and that was you, it's, it, it would not be that easy. We know Frankie has taken Maggie as the second daughter, even yeah. referring to her as Mokushla, which yeah. loosely translated to my darling, my blood. Yeah. And the literal transaction is actually my pals, but there you go. It just shows that he saw Maggie as you're my daughter. Yeah. And I'm not I'm not ready. I'm not ready to lose you. And there was a moment where Frankie was reading um to Maggie uh, a poem by W. B. Yeats. Mm-hmm. Because there are different ways in which you can translate that. Mm-hmm. And from well, from my point of view, he was translating it into there's still hope, there's still love, there's still life to live. Yeah. We could we could go to the cabin and we could own the um the pie shop and we could live happily ever after. You could go to uni, you could get all those um wheelchairs, we could blow into it. And that's from Frankie's point of view, because he was not ready. Yeah. And the fact that Maggie was just sitting there smiling, putting up a brave face, knowing intrinsically that she's done. Like she's experienced everything she could have imagined. Mm -hmm. Her at 31, she never believed that this would be her. She's done it. She's pretty much won a million. She's pretty much worth a million dollars. More than she would have imagined. Exactly. And and it's so exciting how... The inter- they bring this sort of um theme of as you said suicide because whatever your political views or whatever your religious views on that is, you could still see how I don't want to get too deep with this, but it was just sad. It was harrowing to see Frankie having to go through that because in it, in himself he lost another daughter. And in regards to euthanasia, that is quite you know obviously it's very heavy sort of subject matter um but that's also character development on UOT because um we covered Ricky Gervais's afterlife and mm. we did talk about um a little bit about euthanasia and that sort of thing and the fact that you're even expressing w- as far as you're expressing now is uh is a lot further than you would have been willing to express in the afterlife episode. So check out our afterlife episode. Um, it is a heavy show, but it's also quite good. Ricky Gervais recently won um, a prestigious award well for his performance. Yes. And he liked our tweet. So I'm ready. <laughs> Retire it now. After this episode, I'm going to write my resignation for my <laughs> office job. Um, but, you know, without getting too deep into that sort of debate, from a humanistic personal not me personally, but like from a a people person sort of view. Actually, yes, I'm going to own it. Me personally. If someone that you love is struggling and they genuinely want you to help, 
those loved ones should not be persecuted in that process. And that's that's as much as I will say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and everyone is entitled to the opinion on this. Like, it's, it's, it's difficult enough losing someone that you love. And we see Frankie struggling with this. And the fact, I think that this is one of the biggest, like, character development moments we see in Frankie. Uh-huh. And after he helps Maggie pass along, he completely disappears from everyone's radar. Of course, we are shown where it is at the end, but not he, everyone in his circles didn't know about the pie shop apart Only, from Maggie. Yeah. So he, he pretty much just erased himself from. He kind of reminded eyes. me of like whether whether you believe it or whether it's more of a like entertainment sort of thing. He kind of reminded me of like a ghost, like not a Bobby Brown mount you in your sleep ghost. <laughs> um, but Daddy Eastwood, you're most welcome. Um, He's not dead yet, but when <laughs> but um, like he reminded me of like a ghost. Like he he isn't done with this world, so he's just gonna keep lingering around until his business is done, yeah. right? So it was kind of like that because you saw, as you were mentioning, you know, he was battling his own demons, and that's actually quite an interesting um, thread that I want to pull on mm-hmm. at the moment. Aside from pulling on UOT. In regards to the relationship with his daughter, a lot of the time I was getting distracted. So I'm not sure about you guys, but when I watch something and there are foundational questions in regards to the core narrative that aren't being answered, it's hard for me to concentrate. And one of those foundational threads was what happened to his family? Mm. Like, and I was like, oh, was, was this, was a daughter in a car accident with a mom and, you know, like somehow she's not well or, you know, that sort of thing. It really distracted me. It Mm. really distracted me from the film because it obviously plays a part in his dynamic with Maggie. Yeah. Right. And any, any sort of um, demons that he didn't resolve within himself with his relationship with his daughter, he was reconciling with his relationship with Maggie. Mm. Right. And to be able to see that play out in the film was beautiful, right? Because he was very reluctant. You know, you might know that how you deal with things isn't the best way to deal with it. Mm. You might know that your coping mechanisms aren't healthy and they're actually to your own detriment. Yeah. But it's one thing to know something and it's one thing to be ready to take action across it. Oh, for sure. And that's exactly what we were facing in Frankie's character. He wasn't ready to deal with shit. And even if we bring in Morgan Freeman's character, he wasn't ready to deal with that either. Mm. Because to some extent, he felt responsible for Morgan Freeman's character losing his eye. Yeah. Like Odin from American Gods. Yeah, and you see how this affects him in dealing with other people and it actually in his actual job because he has this amazing boxer with him willie big willie big willie yeah and he keeps he keeps on telling him two more fights two more fights two three more fights you'll be ready for the championship you know he keeps on holding him back and protecting him Mm -hmm. you're not ready you're not ready and this is more towards because of all the guilt he's carrying all the burden he's carrying he wasn't ready to let that go. And slowly with Maggie, you can see him trying to push that boundary in him. Yeah. And create this symbiotic relationship where he's getting this affection from Maggie and, and it just makes him grow as a person, help him alleviate the burden. And he doesn't, even when he goes to church, I think when the, I think one of the moments um, he went to church, mm-hmm. while, he was still, um, while Maggie was still fighting uh, her best, you could see he was different. He he wasn't antagonizing the priest that much, as what <laughs> like the, from the, the start of the movie. The, near the end of the film, the priest actually said something very harrowing to Frankie's character, saying, "You've come to mass every day for around twenty three years. The only people I know that do that are people that can't forgive themselves." Mm. Mm. And he was saying that the weight of what you're about to do assisting um maggie Mm. you won't be able to live with yeah right he was wrong in that instance according to the narrative but the point is if you don't deal with your shit it will manifest in other ways yeah you might be walking around minding your own business but sometimes it's quite visible that to other people that you've got some demons you need to reconcile Mm. and that was frankie all over 
Yeah. It really yeah. was. Um, did Morgan Freeman's character have a gambling problem? <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. Him and he loosely his... admitted about it, yeah. Yeah. Did you submit your idea about your house socks to him? Ah, with the holes? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, why are you submitting your socks to the movie? You've got to have socks with holes in them so that your toes can breathe. And what big toes it's a, they it's are. A design, it's a fundamental design flaw in socks. Socks with no holes, not great, mate. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's OT's campaign line. It's just crazy they went with ripped jeans first without, before going to ripped socks are as you, a fashion statement. <laughs> are you really choosing to take a stand here? Yup. See, sometimes people ask for levity. That's what you get, guys. <laughs> OT and his most holy of socks. Mm-hmm. Let's... Let's 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 bring in some levity, right? Properly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in regards to the other characters. Who do you want to start with first? Danger? Let's start with Danger. Oh. Most it, it is quite formulaic. Like when you have a story and you're expanding out characters, you usually have a character that is pretty useless, but they're also pretty harmless and you just want the best for them. Yeah. And Danger was that. Mm. If anyone's watched The Wire, he was like a likable Ziggy. Yeah, and definitely. He, he was. He had that sort of twang to him as well, which was quite fun to listen to. <laughs> I really felt bad for him. Like, and you knew something bad was going to happen to his character. Yep. I was like, hopefully he doesn't die, but he did get a beating. Yeah, he got a beating. Which shook his character a bit. Yeah. And he gave up on his dream because he realized that he's not cut out for it. But I think even Morgan Freeman's character said they didn't have the heart to tell him that the guy that he keeps challenging has retired like yeah. three years ago as well. Yeah. Like he's he's not good for much, but he's minding his own business. He's you got know? heart. He's yeah, and that's what they were saying. That's all he's got. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, because it's kind of different. Like you get you get Margie has strength and skill. You yeah. know, raw skill. And then you have Danger, who's just all heart. The opposite. Oh, Maggie had heart as well. Yeah, Maggie had heart, but she had other things going for her. She did. <laughs> Danger just has a lot of heart and belief in himself. And sometimes, even when they started, um, na- when Scrub started narrating um, in the movie, he said that heart is what gets you killed. Mm-hmm. Which is true. Yeah. So uh, the fact that Mackey, he, oh, what's his name? Anthony Mackey. Mackey, Mackey. It was bloody annoying. Anthony Urethras. He's got such a hateable face, doesn't he? Listen to our Black, uh, not Black Mirror episode. Mm. Does he have a hateable face? I don't know. I just feel like I he want just, to punch him every time. He looks like a jackass. <laughs> I feel like I want to punch him every time. Well, he's your new Captain America. Isn't I'm he? the captain now. That's my captain. <laughs> <laughs> O.T. Phillips. O.T. Phillips. Oh, Tom Hanks is a national treasure. Let's international. International, yeah. He's like the daddy of America. <laughs> the daddy of everywhere, mate. Wow. Really? Yeah, I, I don't think I've ever seen anyone be like, Tom Hanks, I don't like him. And if they do, I don't want to know who they are. <laughs> I really don't. But yeah, Dan- Danger was a very likable character. Mm. Um, you want to talk a bit about your Anthony Mackey? Oh, he's a dick. He had, oh, the fact that Scrape is the one that punched him out just to put him in his oh, place. and he called it as his 110th fight. Yeah, yeah. That was something amazing. Yeah. I feel like I want to go and watch that scene after this. Right? <laughs> it's just one of those, like, good moments. Mm. Those comeuppances, mm. right? mm and you know there's a problem if Michael Peña has more character development than you, Anthony Mackie. Oh, for sure. Was he trying to have like a fresh accent? Yeah, he was actually kind of fresh. It was this. very inconsistent. I don't know if this is a universal term for the rest of the world, but in Australia in particular, fresh means someone that is not from a Western country. Like the fresh off the boat. Yeah, like my people. <laughs> See, OT would never touch that. <laughs> yeah, but he would be like, "I am the captain," but <laughs> never my people. <laughs> I am safe. You are. But it is such a beautiful film, and I really don't know anyone that didn't enjoy this. Really, yeah. what's not to enjoy? 
it had everything. It had a fully encompassing, wholly realized narrative. It had secondary characters that you care about. And let me just say, yes, Maggie was the perfect protagonist. But at the same time, I usually expect great protagonists, right? Mm. Because if that's, hello, that is like the meat and potatoes of your film. So if your protagonist is shit, then everything else is going to fall apart around it, Mm. right? What I love to see is when you have secondary characters that have more than one dimension to them that you actually care about, that any sort of questions you might have about their background get answered. Oh, yeah. And that is one of the makings of a great story. Oh, for sure. So we really have quite an interesting sort of dynamic between Frankie, Maggie, and Scrap. Yep. Right? And it all ties in quite nicely together. What Maggie initially wasn't getting from Frankie, she got from Scrap. Mm. And it it really moved between the pendulum of these characters. One of the moments that you um, pointed out was the whole narration, right? You know, it's usually a given. If you're going to have Morgan Freeman on your project and you're not getting him to narrate, then what's the point? (laughs) It's like paying Gordon Ramsay just to shout at you and not make you a meal. Mm. right like you you need to get the whole package when you have morgan freeman so i really thought nothing of it when he was narrating but to really tie together the loose ends of the film and the reason he's narrating is because he's writing a letter to frankie's daughter Mm. let me do that with two hands (laughs) wow Because, again, that was one of those threads that I kept pulling at in that film. It's like, okay, this is cool. They're traveling the world and they're fighting and, you know, super cute guy. But why? Why are they not addressing the relationship that he or Frankie had or didn't have with his daughter? Mm. And once we got to the point where he was writing that letter, you know what? As someone that continually gets distracted by foundational questions not being answered, I was satiated. And I was satisfied. It was enough for me to know that the daughter was being reached out to, that I didn't need to know the hundreds of questions that I felt I needed answered. And that's a great way to shut KT up. Uh, and one of the questions they answered, I think, in Frankie's relationship with the daughter is the fact that the daughter doesn't want to hear anything from the father. So you know the mm-hmm. relationship has been severed quite a bit. Um, Frankie has been writing her letters weekly. And they all come back um, with a return to send a stamp on it, which is heartbreaking. And you can see him, it affects him. But having the fact that Scrap, hopefully she will read that letter just because it's not from the father. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> that's, that's it. Yeah, you need a body to reach out to your family, mate. Um, it's just oh, heartbreaking. It's touching. Um, he accepted that he probably won't see Frankie again. Yeah. And I guess that was the reason why he was writing this letter in the first place, just to illustrate how Frankie isn't the same person he was a decade or how many years it's been. And I think that's quite a very deeply resonating lesson in this film. Mm. Redemption is always available to you. We don't know what happened between his family. And again, for the purposes of the narrative, we didn't need to know, Mm -hmm. right? We didn't need to know what sort of um, miscomings he had with his family. And obviously sometimes there's too much hurt for you to go back and forgive. And maybe that's what happened in Frankie's case. But he gained redemption through Maggie. Yeah, He also gained redemption whether he took it or not. He gained redemption through Scrap's character. Mm. And that's such a beautiful lesson to learn. You may have burnt a bridge, but you're not wholly discarded as a person. And I hope everyone feels that way. Yeah, people make mistakes and you have to come back from them stronger. Whether or not you've burnt a bridge with someone, there'll always be that someone else that will help you get along. Um, And I reckon that that's just one of the major motifs in this Um, motifs <laughs> it's a funny word um, i'm just giving you time to pull your glasses up <laughs> you know i used to do art and craft well they call it yeah it was called art and craft or whatever the fuck i was and our teacher was so into motifs oh you need to present your motifs at the end of the week 
What a bloody far out. <laughs> Don't want to go back to his schooling days. A little sad OT like <laughs> Archer. It is lacrosse game. Yeah, for sure. That's an Archer reference, guys. <laughs> but Frankie and Scrub's character, you know they've been through a lot together. Oh, yeah. And the fact they came up together. They were yeah. rising in the ranks together. Yeah, they came up together. And do you remember the story Frankie was telling um well Scrap was telling us that um Scrap was it was Scrap's last fight and he was all beat up and afterwards yes. they'd driven up to some gas station, they didn't have a car or whatever afterwards, and they tried to hitch a ride, but no one gave Scrap a ride and Frankie got into a car and left. Mm-hmm. But soon afterwards, Frankie just stopped and got off the car and came back all the way for him. Yeah. It just shows you the kind of character Frankie is. It's the guilt, you know. He he holds things really. He, everything affects him in such a heavy way. And it shows, it paints a picture of him as a character and how everything, all the interactions he has and the sort of wall that he's built up to try and not get too close to everyone and anyone. Um, when Big Willie came and said to him that he's leaving. He was like, you could, fine. You could, you he could, was like, go. <laughs> not really. Like, he, he, he didn't really understand. He was like, but you're going to someone who doesn't know what to do with you. And then Big Willie was like, but you've taught me everything I need to know. Yeah, because he wasn't ready at that time to change or to grow. Yeah, he wasn't ready. And, you know, the times when you look at characters like that and you get angry. Yeah. I wasn't. Like you could see the guy has baggage and the way he delivered that performance, you could, you could feel it. You could sense it. He it was visible. It was visible. The shit that he hadn't sorted out was fucking visible. Mm. And I just want to spend, we don't have to finish off on this, but I do want to spend some time talking about Maggie's family. Crap, 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 crap. Mate. I think I might've mentioned in a, podcast episode but i am a professional cut you out of my life sort of person whether you're whether you're family whether you're the prime minister whether you're ot like if you and um, if you were bringing toxic sort of and i know let's all wank over that word because people use toxic a lot but you know if there are people that are bringing bad vibes to my life i just cut them the fuck off who has the time life's too short mate yeah and you remember that listen ot <laughs> 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 no but seriously i i just don't have time i just don't have time for people that bring their bullshit and try to make it my bullshit i've got my own bullshit i need to deal with mm. right go and deal with your own shit right and that's what i really loved about Ma- maggie's character right because the first time right frankie's like once you get a little bit of money go and buy a house and what did sweet maggie do she bought a house for her mom she went there after a fight with Frankie and Frankie saw firsthand what her family was like. And the mom's like, why did you buy me a house? Why didn't you just give me that money? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how you feel about um, your family. Hopefully your family as well, but wow. Yeah, bloody hell. That was hard to watch. That was so ungrateful. And even the sister as well. No one can fuck you up more than your family can fuck you more than your family that's for sure but that was terrible and then we move further into the film where they had been there for a week when maggie was in hospital but they just went parading around they went to disney yes they went to all of the theme parks and they even had the audacity the gall, how dare you to wear all of those shirts and go into the hospital and try to get her to sign some documents so they could keep the money. I'm assuming it was guardianship or some yeah, shit. So they could transfer the money, they'd be caretakers and And uh, you know what? It's it's one of those things. No matter I feel like family are really the only people that can treat you like shit, but you continue to allow them in your life. Mm-hmm. Right. So when Maggie told Frankie to leave the room, I'm like, Oh, come on, girl. Be strong. Be stronger because I was worried that she was going to concede. Yeah, me too. I was really worried for her because I, I wanted her to stand strong. And that's what she did. She did. And I was so proud of her. That's gross. Because it's really, you know, you, you can have your friends and you can have, you know, your acquaintances and stuff. But it's hard to know where to cut the line with family. Mm. It's like they can do whatever the fuck they want to you. And then you'll be like, okay, fine. I love you forever. And even when she went to go and buy the house and the mom kept complaining, she was doing that to guilt her because she's like, oh, I'm sorry. I'll send you more money. 
after buying a house, she said, I'll send you more money. Yeah. Right? Cut to that hospital room where she's like, well, because you never did the paperwork, you never signed it. So at any time, I can sell that fucking house. Mm-mm-mm. From God's mouth to my ears. Yeah, from my mouth to your ears. <laughs> let's let's just save some time right there. <laughs> oh, but that was there was it was literally if this film wasn't called Million Dollar Baby, it could have been called Holy Realized Character Development. It also <laughs> it also could have been called Squabbling Old Men, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's let's finish off with something lighter. Um scrap. And also Frankie had some very cute exchanges between each other. They did. The first one being the socks. No, not the first one, but one of them we've already mentioned Mm -hmm. was about the socks. Mm. Right. And the reason why he's not wearing his day socks is because they have too many holes in them. Yep. Even though his night socks already Uh, had holes in them. (laughs) It's the level of holes, mate. Right. (laughs) And I think one of the first sort of cute bickering that they had was the bleach. Mm. Who, who argues over that? Oh, <laughs> the pricier ones smell better right <laughs> and it's, it's just so funny how they really get each under each other's skin because when you know someone for that long you can you can squabble over the most tiniest of shit yeah right and it was fun and it was without cute. being without it being too personal and when willie won the title Ooh. frankie couldn't sleep and he went and bought a burger and he gave the burger to scrap <laughs> it was cute it was such a nice it would be of course i love you you're my lover and my best friend um to have that sort of friendship mm. when you're old and gray i'm not sure if this means we're doing bucket list with morgan freeman uh, it was jack nicholson as well wasn't yep. it i'm not sure if we're gonna go in today but it was nice to have that sort of friendship that is bolstered in understanding and withstood a lot of hardship because you know like friendships lovers relationships whatever it is it is not truly a foundational connection until you've gone through shit together true and you could see that frankie and scrap have done that Mm. even to their holy socks and their bleach as well so you mentioned about the title Mm -hmm. i just have a question for you and i'll give you my opinion on this as well after of Um, course you will that's what you always do (laughs) what do you (laughs) think the title means you mean literally what does the title whatever mean? what did it, what does it mean to you or how did he translate it as million dollar baby what do you think it means oh see you know we we're watching a boxing film you should have said the the title of the movie because i thought you meant the, like the heavyweight title mate you watch too much wrestling come on now <laughs> i'll see you in the ring brother <laughs> and i still ascertain that mick foley was Kane, at least in the early years. You're ridiculous. I will shout it from the rooftops. <sighs> Do you want a Rikishi smiley face again or after the show? <laughs> after the show. <laughs> 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 oh, mate, most of these people are in patrons, mate. They're not privy to this. <laughs> <laughs> and what a privy they should be. Uh-huh. Million Dollar Baby? Mm-hmm. You know what? I haven't actually thought of it. Yeah, right. No, you're a dick because you obviously have no. Some like it sort just came to me response. because you mentioned it. You mentioned it. You mentioned how the movie should have been called uh, Dandy Wankery or something. I don't know what you just said a minute ago. Okay, <laughs> if anyone wants to, if anyone wants to pick up OT's Australian Dandy Wankery um, film title, please let us know. Uh, Think Blue Lagoon. <laughs> and I was like, oh, what do you think it actually means to you? Or what did you take from the title of the movie? I haven't thought past the fact that she won a million dollars. Uh, true. It could be. It could, it could be taken like that. Wow, you were really hoping for a deep moment, weren't you? I was hoping for a deep moment because I was thinking it more in terms of like a million dollars. Of course, it's what so much. It means a lot to someone. It means a lot to Frankie. Um, and baby is some sort of term of endearment where you you can tie Makushla in there, Mokushla in there. I think it's just how much she meant to Frankie. Nice. You know what? I never thought about it that way, OT. Mm. And we are the perfect balance, just like this film. Although I shotgun being scrap, you can be Frankie. Yeah, best trainer. I can take that. Okay, you win this time. <laughs> I do want to finish off with a quote mm-hmm. from the film. Are you okay with that? Yep. 
So this is during the end of the film where Frankie is confiding in Scrap about assisting Maggie. Maggie walked through that door with nothing but guts. No chance in the world of being what she needed to be. It was because of you that she was fighting the championship of the world. You did that. People die every day, Frankie. Mopping floors, washing dishes, and you know what their last thought is? I never got my shot. Because of you, Maggie got her shot. If she dies today, you know what her last thought would be? I think I did all right. <laughs> you look and sound like that meme. What meme? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, wow. Because that's it. Your, your unfulfilled potential. Mm. Constantly thinking of what if. Yeah. Everyone's going to die. Have. I should yeah. have done that. Yeah. Everyone's going to die. And mm-hmm. at least when you do go, you shouldn't have any regrets. You should live your life to the fullest, embrace everything, and um, live life without restrictions, mate. You know, you only get one shot and take it. And you know what? That's exactly what we did. We started a podcast because we're brave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us um, along the journey. I'm not sure if we're the Joe Swanson of podcasts and we're always making things deep and sad. <laughs> I think that's kind of our aesthetic now. That's a Family Guy reference. You are most welcome. And speaking of, we are diving into For Your Reference. OT. Ooh. Ooh. I'm going to go with Invictus because um, Clint oh, Eastwood directed it and it has it stars Morgan Freeman as Nelson Mandela. It delves into... I'm Matt Damon. I'm Matt Damon. It delves into um, the time in apartheid in South Africa while well, the teams were still... when There was still segregation um, and how rugby brought a nation together. So it's a lovely movie if... A lot of you aren't aware of what's happened. What happened in Africa, in South Africa at the time, um, and Victor's will paint a light picture of how that was and how sport, no matter how trivial you might think it is, can unite a nation. Yeah, and th- there are unspoken ways to bring people together. Yeah, sports, food, and good-looking people for sure. And you can get all of that with for your reference, guys. Mm-mm. My turn. Yep. You know what, OT? Mm-hmm. Watching this film has really made me want to go back and watch something I've already watched. And let's continue this Clint Eastwood love train. Mm. Daddy Eastwood. I will reference Gran Torino. Because I watched it, and like you said, with Million Dollar Baby, I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> right? I feel like I need to give it another go. So I liked Gran Torino. I feel like I liked it, but I feel like I didn't immerse myself. Mm. Right? So hop aboard the Eastwood train because we are heading to Euphoria. So thank you so much, guys. Thanks for tuning in on Twitter and Instagram. We are For Your FYR. You can write us an email at hello at FYRpodcast.com. And we'll see you guys next week. See ya. Bye.